populations are dynamic. There's tons of variables, there's tons of factors that influence whether a population grows, grows exponentially, grows flatline, or decreases. And that's true of, of plants, it's true of animals, it's true of fungi and everything else, and it's, and it's true of us. So um, we're going to start population dynamics here. However, uh, there's gonna be sort of this great shift between wildlife population dynamics and human population dynamics. Wildlife populations don't deal with things like economy, education, religion, culture, um, various historical events like wars, okay? So wildlife populations are, gonna, are, are regulated by different factors than human populations. Furthermore, the human populations don't have other external factors like poaching or um, you know, habitat loss, things like that. So we're gonna start here with just some very basic terminology and basic mindset of the things that I want you to think about when you think about whether or not a, a population is going to become threatened and endangered, or, uh, excuse me, that would be threatened or endangered, or rise exponentially like rats. talk about wildlife here but but uh, plants is the same way so uh, one of the things that we'll talk about wildlife here in Texas we'll um, start with reproductive potential and that is, and I'm not gonna, def I'm not gonna write this out. You guys don't want to watch me sit here and write out a definition. Besides, you're all on a computer. You're you're googling away. You know, definition, dictionary.com, reproductive potential will take you seconds. But I'm gonna give you some examples from right here in Texas, right here where we live in the post oak savannah eco region. Wild hogs versus white-tailed deer. Wild hogs may have litters of nine, and they may have litters of nine two or three times a year per female. White-tailed deer per female in a great year. Loads of water, loads of fruits and nuts and, and acorns and everything, loads of vegetation for them to eat. Perfect resource uh, availability, and they're going to have two. It might have twins in a year. And that, that's best case scenario, okay? Look at the reproductive potential difference. So these become, they're exotic, but this is why they're invasive. One of several reasons is because they have a much greater reproductive potential. Uh, right here in Texas and, and all across the South, um, there's another invasive exotic called the snakehead, northern snakehead, Chana argus. And it is very, very similar to another species called the bowfin. Uh, it has several names throughout the south. And you, again, you can pause this video and look up the two fish, and you'll see that they look very similar. They live in very similar habitats and things like that. The northern snakehead is uh, from Europe. It is That's where it evolved, and it has become exotic and invasive exotic over here. That fish, per female, may have twice as many eggs as our native bowfin do. Twice as many. And so there's a reproductive potential all off the bat, just from the get-go, before we talk about resource availability and, and habitat use and everything else, just how many eggs do they lay? And Chana Argus, the, the northern snakehead, has already won the game, simply just based on the number of eggs. Resource availability, or what we call allocation. And again, I'm not going to bore you writing out, watch my back as I write out definitions. I'm just going to give you some examples. So resource availability, when we talk about resources, what does that even mean? So your basic resources, food, water, shelter, 
Next time you use a different marker. You know how it is, gotta have a fresh marker. So availability or allocation, those are really two different concepts. Availability is just, is it there at all? Are the resources even there? And allocation has to do with what else is using those resources? Okay, so whether or not there, this is there's a whole lot, there's almost too much to define here, particularly with the space that I have, but there can be decreases in food. And this is part of the problem with habitat loss. If, if you live in the rainforest and you eat the fruits that fall from the trees and then loggers come through and cut all the trees down, well, I'm still right here. I'm still right here in this habitat. However, my food resources are now gone. It rains all the time. I've got loads of water, but if I don't have any food, well, then my population doesn't grow and it decreases. We become threatened and endangered. Does that make sense? And so that, and that's true of, of everything here. Let's say that you like shelter. Well, we'll talk about some species here in Texas. If you're a cavity nesting bird, um, trying to think of a few off the top of my head, uh, maybe the American kestrel. Um, and you can look that up. It's a gorgeous little bird or, or like Merlins and, um, uh, there's, there's loads of others, owls, that sort of thing. If you're a cavity nesting bird and you live in the southern pine forest and the loggers come through, cut all the trees down, but then they plant new trees, plant new trees, okay? And there's loads of trees, thousands of trees. You're right there in East Texas. Rain's the same, right? There's mice and rats, there's food for you, right? However, if there are no old growth trees that have hollowed out centers, there's no cavities in those trees, well then you don't have a way to make nests. You don't have a, a way to live out your life cycle. So the shelter has decreased, even though these other resources are still available. Let's talk about allocation. Let's say that uh, you're a deer and you eat, you're, you're really hoping on all the acorns that fall on the ground. And you really need that to make it through the winter. However, there's been an explosion in the rat population. The rats are cleaning house. Uh, uh, they're, they're cleaning up uh, acorns left and right. Wild hogs, wild hog herds have moved in. They're nomadic. And so they, the several herds have moved in and they're eating like crazy. They've got piglets everywhere. And little piglets are eating up all the acorns. Well, whether or not those resources, they're there. The food's there. The water's there, the shelter's there. But those resources are being reallocated to other populations and not to yours. So your population is going to start to decrease, flatline and decrease. And those other populations of those invasive exotics are going to start to increase. One of the other major factors that affects how organisms population goes up or down or whether or not they will go up or down is called zone of tolerance. Zone of tolerance has to do with the abiotic factors. Okay, not, this is not the interaction between invasive exotics and stuff like that. Zone of tolerance has to do with, sorry, I'm in the way. Zone of tolerance has to do with the range of biotic fact, or of uh, abiotic factors that an organism can deal with in its environment. And, and I'll give you some examples, just in your own, your own life, okay? So, like in your house, you try to keep the temperature within, you know, a pretty close range. So, let's say you live in Alaska and it's negative 30 outside. Well, that would be too cold in your house, right? You wouldn't want it to be negative 30 in your house. So, that, that's outside your zone of tolerance, right? You can't, you can't be exposed to that for very long. Maybe, maybe for a few minutes you, you can handle negative 30. But if you're out of negative 30 for a long time, then you'll die. 
Same thing with like, let's say the heat in my car. Okay, it is, I'm sorry, low battery. Anyway, the, the heat in my car. So when I open my, when I go out to my truck and I open the car door, it's gonna be approximately 140, 150 degrees inside that car. I, I can take it for a few minutes while the, the truck cools off, but you can't handle 150 degrees for very long because you'll die, okay? It's outside your zone of tolerance. Now, it doesn't matter who else is in the truck with me or, or who, what else is going on in society in Alaska or whatever, but if I'm exposed to that abiotic condition for too long, that's it. I'll die because it's outside my zone of tolerance. Now, organisms, let me, let me pause here and write, write that. So this is a, a range of abiotic factors that an organism may or may not be able to handle. Good. Now, uh, like say right here in Texas, and, and you've seen a lot of the videos from around the neighborhood that I live in and the kind of area I live in, and I'll try to show you a, a bullhead catfish if I can catch one in a trap. Now, bullhead catfish can live in your, your fish tank. I raised one when I was a kid. I grew up right over off of Jackson Road over there, and uh, I raised a bullhead catfish in my tropical fish tank, swimming around, and eventually, they're not good pets, don't do that, because it, it ate all my fish. But anyway, um, one of the neat things about bullhead is they can handle extremely low oxygen levels. So when I release the fish into the wild, it is a native, native fish here, and I, I got it out of the wild. I, got, I caught it in a creek where they're native, and I released it into Lake Louisville, and it's probably dead. But anyway, um, I could have released that fish into water that was extremely low oxygen like in a swamp for instance or a stagnant stagnant pond like you saw in some of my other videos uh, where I talked about turbidity and things like that um, because it can handle extremely low oxygen if I did the exact same thing with a similar catfish of a different species like a channel catfish then that fish would die because that super super low oxygen condition is outside of its zone of tolerance. If I did it with a blue catch, catfish, it would certainly die. If I did it with a largemouth bass or anything else, it would certainly die. So that abiotic range of oxygen level, right, has affected what organisms' populations could increase and what populations are going to decrease or, or even crash dramatically, and those organisms are gonna be extinct from that habitat or gonna be gone from that habitat altogether. And so that, these, you know, this is a biological issue. That's just how many eggs are going to lay, how many babies are going to have, right? And the resource availability, that can, be also, that can be everything from habitat destruction, climate change, it can be the presence of invasive exotics. And zone of tolerance, that is just physical state, physical issues, abiotic factors that the organism may be able to deal with that others can't. Or... It may be abiotic factors that it can't deal with that everything else can. So, uh, and, and, and so, uh, like, of those two, let's talk fish for a second again. Uh, we've already mentioned, or I've already mentioned, Channa Argus, the, the northern snakehead. It can handle very cold climates uh, in Russia and things like that, and it can also handle the, the nice, sweaty, warm climates of Florida. And it can handle that whole range in between. So they become a, a, a pretty serious invasive exotic because it can handle a lot of things. It can even breathe air. It can handle extremely low oxygen levels. So you almost can't kill them. Uh, they can even live out, outside of water for like three days. So it, it's amazing how little oxygen they, they can have and survive. Now the way opposite end of that is something like a salmon that if the water is even slightly turbid or if the, if the water is slow at all, if there's any decrease in oxygen for any reason, they're out. If the water warms up for any reason, even a little bit, you would touch it and swear that it's cold. But if you look into some reading about the decrease in salmon populations in Alaska, you'll see that they can't handle any change in that water quality. If it, it look just a few degrees warmer, they're out. If it's turbid, they're out. Low oxygen, they're out. 
and there are invasive exotics that can handle those changes. And that's part of the reasons that you see in an ecosystem, some populations start to, starting to creep up or explode, and some populations decrease a little bit or crash altogether.